My name is Caroline Late and I am a trans woman rugby player. I was born in 1965 and like most children of my generation, I grew up surrounded by family and friends and for all intents and purposes, I appeared to be a very happy child. Of course, I had to deal with my gender identity issues. I realised I had to keep those issues secret as during the 1970s and 80s, society was predominantly uneducated about transgender people, so sport became my salvation. My first venture was playing rugby league as a four-year-old with my older brother Todd for the Tarrant Point Youth Club under sevens in 1970. While Todd excelled, I chewed on my sleeve and watched the trains go by. But by age six, I'd worked out how to play the game and I scored my first try in my last ever game in the under sevens. The following year, we went all the way to the grand final. When I was 12, I was sent to boarding school and switched from rugby league to rugby union. I attended St. Joseph's College, Hunters Hill. While there, I played cricket, rode, ran and played rugby. I was selected for two Joey's senior athletics teams in 1982 and 83. I also played in the Joey's third 15. Not a bad effort to considering Joey's went down to the 16th 15. On leaving school, my rugby education continued. I played for Eastern Suburbs in 1985. In 1986, I graduated from Colts Rugby to grade. I played Shoot Shield when I replaced Derek Murdoch, who broke his leg against Eastwood. In 1987, my best friend and former Joey's classmate, Tony Daly, asked me to switch to Gordon, and that was my last season of grade rugby. Later that year, I met Sophie, and 18 months later, we married. She became my muse. If I couldn't be female, I'd live my life through her. I decided to trial with NRL Club South Sydney at their 1988 Open Day Trials with my mate Daly. After my trial, I stood in the dressing room and my gender dysphoria briefly hit me. At the time, there were no formal women's rugby competitions and I used gender norms as a definition and was in self-denial about my issues. I quietly said to myself, I can't be female. Look what I just did. A week later, a letter arrived in the post. I trained with South over the 1988-89 off-season. Even though I didn't win a contract, I enjoyed my time training and trialling with the Rabbitohs. Fast forward to 1991 and Sophie and I split. I played rugby league professionally in the Group 6 Country Rugby League competition. By 1992, I tired of the homophobic and misogynistic attitudes of my playing mates. As a fitness professional, I decided to compete in the more inclusive aerobic sport competitions. Three years later, age 30, I plucked up the courage to exist as my true and authentic self. Sport was the last thing on my mind as my body feminized from the hormone therapy I was undertaking. My body took to it like a duck does to water and I feminized rather quickly. I now appeared on the outside how I'd always secretly envisioned myself to be. My mother had caught me dressed up in clothes from her fashion label several times in my teens. She thought at the time I was dressing to please a sexual fetish rather than gender identity so she steered me towards being hyper masculine. She told me all I could be was a female impersonator. I thought she meant that Edna. But years later, she told me she meant Carlotta. As for Tony Daly, he became a Wallaby and played 41 tests. He won a Rugby World Cup in 1991. He recently told me how can you help who you are, trans women should be allowed to play. Daly offered his testimony if needed. After my transition, I tried to be the stereotypical female the gender psychiatrist had set out for me. I dated guys for a while. I tired of this and saw an opportunity. I sprinted and had some success at the 2002 Sydney Gay Game. I was encouraged by fellow Masters Athletics friends to continue competing. Of course, I had tests done in accordance with the 2003 IOC guidelines for transgender athletes. I passed with flying colours and more success followed. I I was in shape from my track training, so I thought, why not try women's rugby? I did in 2004 and had an excellent year. The coaches surrounded me with all types of praise and then made promises towards the future. This lasted until my Sydney rep coach added me to all and sundry. I went from the penthouse to the outhouse in one fell swoop. I even had to show cause as to why I could continue to play on. I supplied my gender tests and letters from my medical professionals and I said, I'll see you in court, boys. They backtracked and I played on. So this proposed rugby band is nothing new as we go back to the future.
In 2005, I was assaulted at my own club's training. The coach said it was all my own fault as I should have turned a blind eye. I switched to clubs and was again targeted. Like World Rugby and their working group, my former teammates and coaches didn't want me playing, but they didn't want me playing for anyone else neither. They simply didn't want me around. But I'm proud my Sydney Uni teammates stood up for me. In 2007, fair-minded coaches and managers entered the scene and I was a member of my third national championship winning Sydney representative team. I also made the New South Wales Women's Rugby League team. A bone bruising injury in 2008 ruled me out of all the major representative matches I'd been selected for. I was out for 12 months and other than my representing Hunter Rugby at the 2010 Country Champs, 2008 was the end of my representative career and it was nice to be included as an injured player. As for this proposed rugby ban, it's BS. I was a current player. I know what I'd be doing. I'll see you in court, boys.